Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It was a great honor to be uh, asked to write a chapter in this book because it is near and dear to my heart uh, to find solutions to our healthcare crisis. COVID has truly unmasked the problems that we live in in this crisis-driven healthcare system. We've learned that hospitals live on non-hospital services delivered in a more expensive setting and that that is what has been sustaining them. And when they're reduced to doing hospital only work, they start to lose money. We've seen the flaws of an employer-based healthcare system, which is great if you're employed, have a time-limited illness, like you need your gallbladder out, or have a uh, time-limited illness, like, like uh, or a illness like diabetes, where you can manage your disease and still be able to work. So the purpose of employer-based system is really to keep employees working. It is not a great system for people who are too sick to continue to pay their premiums. We've seen physician practices struggling uh, to stay alive in this system. Uh, we've seen the entire system is way too expensive and we definitely show what the uh, social determinants of health play a huge role in this process. We see the dollars are all in the wrong places. And we see also that the plans for value-based care as the solution to this don't work in a pandemic. Medicare had planned to put everyone at risk and that the solution to the cost of healthcare were to take hospitals and put them at risk for overpayment and practices at risk. And then a pandemic comes along and we're forced to realize that there are risks that we simply cannot afford to absorb in a practice or even a hospital system. Our payment system has driven us into this particular function. Primary care, behavioral health, all of the specialties that live on what are called evaluation and management codes, the people who think about, talk to, and put their hands on patients are not able to survive economically on the payments for doing that. Yet there is huge amounts of money in healthcare. It's $5 trillion. The Part A trust fund is scheduled to go broke in 2023, the part that pays for hospital work. That is frightening to me. And here we have all this money going into healthcare, yet primary care practices, people who talk to and touch patients are going out of business. You make money in healthcare by owning the businesses, the equipment, the services, the site where healthcare is delivered. You don't make money if you actually touch a patient. The hospitals are really rushed into a system where they want to merge and get bigger and bigger and bigger to be able to afford the increasing costs of their own overhead. They build more buildings, the overhead goes up, they have to become a system to make themselves able to support it. They lose money putting people in the hospital, so they start to acquire more and more of the practices and services around them so that they can drive more patients to the hospital-based services, which by the way, cost twice as much as the physician fee schedule led practices. So those hospital systems have now been shown to cost more. They have market share. They can drive higher payments. They become less responsive to the need of the individual community whose hospital got swallowed up into the system and more reactive to the uh, needs of the corporation. Most of what we spend money on is the management of chronic disease. And I include cancer in that these days as we keep people alive <clears throat> often for decades. So we need a system that works well to manage chronic diseases. 90% of our spend is about $3.3 trillion. And that's a lot of money going into that. Yet. What do you need to manage it? Do you need a big brick building on a hospital campus? Or do you need a physician partner 
with the associated services that help you learn how to manage your own diabetes or your hypertension, what to eat, how to exercise. You need someone embedded in your life over your lifetime. You basically need a primary care physician who can manage the team of people who are helping you stay healthy. Yet we've devastated that economic model. If a primary care doctor saw patients all day long and was paid at the Medicare fee schedule rate, worked eight and a half hours a day with half an hour for lunch, took off two weeks a year to try to recharge their batteries, they would be able to make about $130,000 a year. Yet they can go to a hospital and be paid about $250,000 a year to work a week on and a week off. Which would you choose? Is it any wonder that there are no primary care doctors out there? Yet we look at all this money and where is it going? We look at the number of middlemen who have gotten into healthcare. Uh, we look at the large number of people who are managing hospital charge masters. They are increasing prices and negotiating with insurance companies who hire large numbers of people to fight back against hospitals and practices. We see the hospitals as they build more buildings needing more difficulty with, um, with uh, overhead costs. I've noticed that the philanthropists want to put their name on a building that they don't want to pay for the vacuum cleaner and the cleaning staff. So we, we really need to look at where we're spending that money. The difference between hospital and physician fee schedule prices is what we call the site of service differential. Hospitals have had about a 60% increase over the last 20 years in their fees. Medicare estimates of the cost of care have gone up about 30% in the government's estimate, which leaves out little details like electronic medical records and other regulatory requirements. The physician fee schedule has gone up 6% over those same 20 years. So if I sold my practice to a hospital tomorrow and saw the same patient I saw yesterday and did the same thing in the same exam room and the same personnel, billing under the hospital outpatient prospective payment system would cost Medicare double and commercial payers almost triple for the same service. Where does that money go? It isn't going into the physician's pockets and it's not going into patient service. It's going to pay the infrastructure of the medical industrial complex. The consolidation that we've talked about, which is a major problem in our healthcare system, is really focused on increasing market share. It has not been shown to be able to meet the needs of a community better. It is not able to prove that there is increased quality and there is, they claim economies of scale but the entire cost has gone up and we worry that this in our COVID crisis may actually get worse because as practices discover that they can't keep their doors open as small surgical practices can't do the elective surgeries they need they're struggling to be able to stay alive and when the hospital comes and offers a nice salary and not having to worry about it, is it any surprise that physicians sell? And then the hospital has the entire vertical structure. It has the people to refer to it and it has the uh, patients sent to its embedded specialists. They get their imaging on their machines at twice or three times the price. Uh, it is a very expensive way to pay for our system. And those and sick people end up paying double copays. When you end up getting your care from a hospital, you're, you're paying that $5 Tylenol because you're the one who has to support all of that brick and mortar infrastructure. You're supporting the emergency department. You're supporting the things that are really, some of them are definitely a community need, like having an emergency room but another tower, another set of executive suites, et cetera, may not be what you need. And that's what the medical industrial complex is. The, the insurance industry is a major part of that. As the, the hospitals got bigger and joined, then the people who, um, 
that are running the insurance company figure they have to do mergers and acquisitions to stay big enough to fight their way back from the uh, hospitals. So then as they get bigger, the drug companies get bigger and they merge together. And really this is all a very profit driven process. If you're a, an insurance company and you want to make money off drug margin and you get a discount that you can pass on to employers but keep the majority of it, then you a benefit by high drug prices. If you then hire another entity called a pharmacy benefit manager or PBM to be in the middle of this, then they negotiate a discount, they keep part of it, they pass part of it to the insurance company and the patient ends up paying a higher amount. Sometimes the copay is higher than the cost of the drug. But the insurance company is making money, the pharmaceutical company is making money, the hospital isn't harmed by that transaction. And the only person harmed is the patient who is struggling to find the medicines that they need. So we need to unravel some of this consolidation. We need to look at how we purchase healthcare. And in order to know what we're purchasing, we actually need to know what the optimal cost of a service is. So when we're doing that, we need to be able to use some of the business techniques of truly pricing the cost of care. We need to recognize that every business requires a margin. And then if you're paying above that, you have to look at what you're paying for, how many middlemen are really contributing to this entire process. We tried to do that with ACOs. The idea for the, the accountable care organizations was, well, if we put everybody together and we put them at risk, then certainly we will end up with savings. Well, the best ones have been the ones that don't include hospitals and they only saved about $75 a patient. That's the cost of half of an office visit. So what do we do about this? And it'll be interesting to hear these discussions through today. I would start with saying things like, why do we have patients fund emergency departments when emergency departments are clearly something that's for the common good? People will smash into one another on the freeway at two in the morning and they need an emergency department staff to be there. Just like we need a fire department and just like we need uh, police departments, we need emergency departments and they should be tax funded. We should be able to pay equally based on, co on optimal cost, despite the site of service. We need to have transparency in all of these transactions so we know who is pocketing the money of these discounts and rebates. We need to look at the uh, decoupling in insurance and employment. People need to be able to purchase their own individual insurance that can't be canceled if they become ill. That is, after all, what insurance is for. We need to have the insurance companies stop being the most profitable industries on our country. They are remarkably profitable right now at a time when nearly everyone else is suffering. We need to look at whether or not we can regulate that and perhaps have them be not for profit. What would happen if our philanthropists, rather than donating large buildings to hospitals, donated 50 clinics to be rented at a dollar a year to primary care physicians, psychiatrists, and obstetricians to be in local communities and providing that chronic disease management that we so desperately need? Perhaps we would have fewer people traveling to tertiary centers to have their diabetic foot cut off or, or learn how to read braille. We need to restructure this healthcare system. We need to put the money where the need is. We need to make some radical change. And we're facing a crisis now. And someone once said, let no good crisis go to waste. This is our opportunity to make some serious changes in the healthcare delivery system. Thank you very much for allowing me to comment. Thanks, Dr. McEnany. That was great. Um, and uh, just to let everybody know, you can put questions in the chat box. Uh, we're probably going to have to move on now because we have uh, Senator Johnson coming up next. Uh, 
But uh, for those of you that want a deeper dive into what Dr. McEnany was talking about, she has a great book, uh, a, great <laughs> a great chapter in a good book uh, on the medical industrial complex, which more or less is talking about what she just discussed about how, in, in her view, it's anti-competitive and it's making it harder for smaller physician groups to survive and arguably provide better care in a transparent way. We'll hear this afternoon from uh, Keith Smith, who is an example of the price transparency that Dr. McEnany is talking about. And he offers surgeries at one third uh, to one half the price that you will find through insurance reimbursed uh, offerings because of the exact things Dr. McEnany is talking about. 